night. So how many of you have challenges ever getting into church? Anybody ever have challenges like the devil wants to throw stuff at you on your way into church? How many of y'all fought with your wife on the way in here? Just be honest. Come on, a few people. Like, <laughs> so today was one of those days. It was, well, one, I've not been feeling that great lately. For the past few days, I've been slightly under the weather. So I've been battling it just a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just trying to get over that. So I'm not feeling the greatest. And then we had the blessing of having all four of our grandchildren over the house last night. It was incredible. And Mary Jo somehow is not rusty at all. Like she just somehow gets all four of them ready and out of the house. I am absolutely no help. It's terrible. I am awful, you know, but uh, she gets them all out of the house. So we're driving into the, the, the church this morning. We're on our way down there. We're on about 103rd, getting ready to hit 295. And one of our grandchildren, you know, it seems like she's having a little bit of drama back there. Like, ah, you know, whatever. She's putting her head back and acting like, oh, so we're like, I'm saying drama. It's me, not them, right? So I'm the bad guy. I'm like, oh, look at her being a little bit of drama. And all of a sudden she's puking all over the Jeep. Come on, Jesus. I mean, like, and I am not good with that stuff. So if you saw me driving with my head stuck out the window on 103rd this morning like this, ooh, ooh, it wasn't just being crazy. You know, it's one of those days where you come, y'all ever had those kind of days on your way into church or somewhere, right? And uh, man, God is good though. So as we're here today, I told you we're going to go on a little bit of an emotional journey during the course of today's message. So let's go ahead and pray and get ready for where God wants to take us. So Lord, we praise you and give you glory and honor. And some days, uh, getting up, getting out of the house can be an adventure. And today was one of those days. But Lord, I pray that you would give me the heart, the energy, the focus to speak exactly what you would have me say this morning that would impact all of our lives, Lord. I was touched by the songs that we shared earlier. I was touched by the time of offering. And now I pray that you would move through these words as if they were from you directly to each of our hearts that challenges us where challenge is needed and to encourage us where encouragement is needed. And Lord, just move in the midst of this body today to make us all whole, make us all more like you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So last week, if you were not here, we had some wonderful guest speakers that were here all the way from Tel Aviv, Israel, some good friends of ours, Sergey and Natasha, and I think they did just an absolutely great message. So if you missed it, go online and watch it. But the big theme, the general theme was that we need to contend for our time with God. We need to go after it directly. So they related a story in Israel. They have something called Shabbat. It starts on Friday night through Saturday, where essentially the government mandates that pretty much every single business shuts down and everybody is to spend time worshiping God and God alone, right? So it's something that we don't have here. We don't have a time in the United States where we really just shut down. Maybe if you went back a few generations ago, it was a little bit more like that, right? Uh, I remember when we first moved to Jacksonville, even around the year 2000, our kids that might have been participating in outdoor activities, they would not have stuff on Wednesday nights because on Wednesday nights, a lot of people went to church, so the sports leagues didn't do anything on Wednesday. To tell you how far that's come, one of our granddaughters today had to actually go for her sports league on a Sunday morning to do stuff. I mean, that's how far it's come. So we don't have that sacred time here in the United States, so we need to create it ourselves. And he was kind of talking about this tension that we have, that we all have this need to spend time with God, that we might be at peace, that we might better reflect who God is. And then the world is always weighing on us, trying to keep us so busy that we have no time with God. Does anybody sense that tension in life? You want to spend time with God, but it seems that it's not there. So he's saying we actually have to fight for the Shabbat. We have to fight for this dedicated time with God, and that when you do, we get another Jewish word called shalom, peace. There's this sense of peace that comes over us when we spend time with God. He didn't mention this verse, but it really stuck out to me. Genesis 126, you are created and formed in the image of God. So Natasha took a moment where she put a mirror up here on the stage. And she talked about how our emotions can be reflected on others around us. So if you are sad and we start to talk to one another, then all of a sudden I might start getting a little bit more sad. 
But if you're sad and I start to smile, then all of a sudden maybe the atmosphere changes a little bit and your weight doesn't seem so much of a burden anymore and then we might start to smile together. So we have these emotions as human beings that rub off on one another, but one of the things that we don't do enough of that we need to spend more time doing is getting in front of the mirror with God so that we can reflect his image. We need to spend time in the presence of God. The author of Corinthians says this in 13, 12 in 1 Corinthians. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So as we gaze onto this mirror and we're trying to see who God is, the mirror is all dirty. The mirror is all cloudy. It's because of our sin. It's because of our fallenness. And when we approach that mirror for the first time, it's pretty hard to get a connection with God. And sadly, in our generation, all too often, we've limited our time with God to the dinner table. When we pray, Lord Jesus, would you please bless this food? And would you make sure that this bad food that I'm eating doesn't go to my hips or my thighs? Would you please help me out, Lord, right? But we need to spend more time with that. You see, what happens is every time you go to spend time in his presence in front of that mirror, it's like getting the Windex out and cleaning off one layer of grunge. And then you go back again and you spend more time with him and it starts to get more clear. And then all of a sudden you begin to reflect more and more of God's image because you're spending time with him. To give you another analogy, how many of y'all seen those pictures where like a guy has a dog and then the more time they spend with the dog, they start looking like the dog? Have you ever seen those? I'm sure you've seen some of those on the internet, right? If we spend time with God, we will start looking more like God, right? It's a beautiful thing, but we need to contend for that. We need to go for that because the weight of this world is pretty heavy all around us, right? There's challenges, and when we start to spend time in our own heads, I don't know if you're like me, but if I'm not spending time with God and I'm spending time in my own head, things can get dark really quick. Is anybody there with me? You start worrying about all kinds of stuff really fast, right? Is the world falling down around me? Kiki, do you love me anymore? I mean, like, what what happens, right? I mean, like, we start to question everything in our lives. You guys watch too much secular stuff. What is wrong with you? But our minds begin to go to these bad places. Solomon has described in Ecclesiastes 1.1. Listen to what happened when he spent time in his own head. The words of, of the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea. Yet the sea is never full to the place the streams come from, and there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye has never enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been done will be done again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. It is there anything of which one can say, look, is this something new? It was there already long ago. It was there before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Is anybody getting depressed just yet, right? I mean, he goes on, like, I don't, I don't recommend you go read this, like, if you're in a, bad, in a bad spot. I mean, he goes on for another chapter or two, just getting more and more dreary. He goes on and he says, I've tried comfort. I've tried entertainment. I've tried this. Everything is for nothing, right? How many of you have ever felt that way at different times in your life, right? Go watch Fox News this week. Get a picture of what's bad going on right now. I mean, you'll get miserable if you just watch all that stuff and that's input and you're not spending time with God, but you're only spending time dealing with the things of this world because the world is fallen and sadly so are we. So when we disconnect ourselves from God and don't get to spend time with him, we can go to some very dark places very quick, right? And sometimes we can get stuck there. 
God doesn't want you to get stuck there. If you're going through some stuff today, don't get stuck there. God wants to free you from that, right? Pleasure, meaningless. Accumulation of things, meaningless. Food, meaningless. Politics, meaningless. All these things are meaningless, he says. Aren't you really excited about now, right? I told you we're going to go on a bit of an emotional journey. So the other day I was listening to YouTube in the background watching some things and The reason I looked it up was that for some reason God had kind of put on my heart that my stepdad, I was having like an emotional moment thinking about stuff, and I started remembering a song that he would play in his car back in the day. And uh, it, it, it struck me, and I, I remember being five or six years old, hearing it for the first time, and there was a guy named Harry Chapin, who was a late 60s and 70s, very popular guy, storyteller, amazing in his ability to tell stories. And one of the songs that he wrote that was super funny to me as a kid was a song about a banana truck that overturned on the street. Like, I mean, who writes a song about that? It was called 30,000 Pounds of Bananas. So it was ringing in my head, 30,000 pounds of bananas, bananas, and it was going, it'd make you, but now you're starting to smile. I see. I like this just a little bit better, right? 30,000 pounds of bananas. It cheered us up a little bit. Come on, that'd be fun to see turnover on the side of the road, right? So then as YouTube can do, when one song's over, they start going and it starts spinning and the next song begins to come up, right? And then I'm there, I think I was trying to write a message, so I was kind of fired up from 30,000 pounds of bananas. And then all of a sudden, the next song that comes out is none other than Cats in the Cradle and the Silver Spoon, Little Boy Blue and the Man in the Moon, When You Coming Home, Dad, I Don't Know When, right? You all know that song? You young people are like, what is this guy saying? He talked about 60s or 70s. I was born in the 90s. Um, But so Cats in the Cradle comes on. Now, emotionally, I made a shift very quick, right? Maybe you did too. So all of a sudden, I start to get very dreary while I'm sitting there trying to type the message. And I start hearing Cats in the Cradle. I'm like, what a loser father I am. My kids will never love me. Oh my gosh, man, I think of all the mistakes I made and the hours that I worked too long and the times that I probably shouldn't have worked and didn't. And then around the middle of the song, it shifts from the dad going and talking to his son to the dad wanting to spend time with his kids. And then all of a sudden, the kid's like, Dad, can I have the car keys in the middle of the song? You know, and then he, the dad's trying to get time with the kid and the kid's like, you know, Dad... I'll see you later, right? And this song doesn't end very joyfully in the end, to be completely frank with you. So if you're not feeling good right now, don't go listen to that song. And then you're like thinking in your head, I need to shout from the rooftops to all the other young men in the room. Don't do this. Don't mess up, right? So I'm going through all of these different emotions. So that one hit me as a guy. Maybe ladies, you start putting on Jagged Little Pill by Alanis Morissette or something like that. And you're you're listening to Alanis Morissette over and over. And then as you do, you start to hate yourself more and more with every lyric that goes by. And every man in your life, you hate them too, right? So, I mean, don't listen to Alanis Morissette either. So, I like that you're laughing. This is good. I told you. We're going to take you on a bit of an emotional journey, some ups and downs here. But songs and music can be like that too, can't they, right? They can take us to these different places, At moments, you start to feel like crying. At other moments, you're questioning your manhood. Maybe shortly thereafter, another song can come on, and all of a sudden, it starts to lift you back up and... In all seriousness, I've been a little emotional lately as I think of things, and um, last week was one of those moments where I started to weigh a bunch of things that happened back to back on our way into church and then being here, and um, I began to talk. I was back there by the next step station, and Sergey and Natasha and I were talking, and for whatever reason, um, the opioid epidemic came up, and the number of people that were dealing with those challenges, and they were saying, in Israel right now, um, yes, they do have some problems with drugs, mostly say marijuana related issues but they're not dealing with some of the things to the extent that we are with drug addictions and the challenges that are there and I started looking around the room at that very moment in between services and no less than probably eight of the families that were standing in close proximity to me right there including my own had all dealt with this issue either me personally as an addict other family members of mine who are addicts or these other people that I love that were around the room 
that had dealt with this kind of a situation in their life. And I started to feel the weight of it and the Lord just speaking to me. And that's part of why I wanted to do this message today was I just said, man, people are going through some very heavy stuff. It's not limited to addiction either because as the second service kicked up and Mary Jo and I came to the front and then the altar time begins and a couple goes and walks by us and Mary Jo says, would you pray with me? That couple has wanted to have kids and they've been unable to do so. And the weight of that just started to come on me. The heaviness of that with the challenges that some of you are going through. They wanted desperately to have a kid and they were not able to at this time. May the Lord bring fruitfulness in that area of their life, right? Or it reminded me shortly thereafter on the same drive in that day, there is another lady that Mary Jo and I were recounting just how much we loved who one year prior was sitting in Mary Jo's office sobbing uncontrollably, unlike herself, with a pile of tissue paper because her foolish husband decided to leave her and go after a younger woman and leave her where she was at. This woman who seemingly sought after God with all her heart, strength, soul, and mind, a woman who all of us love, and her husband just ups and leaves her for a younger woman. How depressing. You guys are not looking very happy. There's not many smiles that are going on in the room, right? You can feel the weight. But this is what the people sitting next to you are going through. Maybe you're the one that's going through these things, right? I promise you there's hope. Because one of the next thoughts that came to my mind when I was standing back there and I was recounting those people was like every single one of them, guess what? They were still standing. <laughs> they, they were in church that day. They were worshiping God along with us that very morning. In fact, the majority of them were actually serving. And I was like, oh my goodness. They were serving, say, in guest services as people are back there. They're serving behind the scenes. Others of them that had gone through, I know, heavy, heavy stuff in their family. They're leading some of our marriage groups now. And I was like, hallelujah, how amazing is that? They went through the ringer, and now they're on the other side. They have what the Bible describes as a peace that surpasses all understanding. Or as Ephesians says, having done all to stand, but frankly, most of them were doing way more than just standing. They were serving. They were worshiping. In fact, most of them had smiles on their faces. How awesome is that, right? They had gone through some of the deepest things that life could throw at them, and they were still smiling. Only God can do that. Did you hear the songs we sung earlier? Only God can do that. He can turn your mourning, your brokenness, your sobbing into dancing. How amazing is that, right? He loves you that much. Those of you who are going through it this very morning, he loves you that much. He brought you here on purpose for a reason to let you know he loves you and that your circumstances are temporal. He cares for you. He has not forgotten about you. And guess what? All of us at different times in our life are going to go through some of these ups and downs. That you are guaranteed. If somebody told you when you got saved everything was going to be perfect and fine every day, they lied to you, right? They lied to you. Thank God we do get those moments that are joyful, right? But man, there's other moments where it's difficult. Have you ever felt that way? So this message, maybe it started out rather Difficult. It started out in a way that wasn't rejoicing. In fact, it started out downright depressing, right? But then you start to read verses that had become alive in their heart, like Philippians chapter 4. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, if you spend time getting in front of that mirror with God, no matter how dirty it is, no matter how jacked up your life might be at that moment, God will begin to to guard your heart. He will begin to protect you. He will begin to give you a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that shouldn't be there because the circumstances are enough to crush anybody, but to God, it's like a 20-pound weight. And he's like, whoa, bench press this all day. No problem, right? 
He's got it. Would you turn it over to him? If you're spending this much time in prayer, man, start to change that. If you want to reflect Jesus, you've got to contend with, fight for, go after the Shabbat, as they talked about. You've got to go after that time with God. Make it a point this Thursday. What an opportunity. Come on Thursday night. Spend some time in intercession and prayer. Watch what God does. I promise you, after you see those people get baptized, I promise you, after you sing those songs of worship, your problems will seem a lot smaller. Because they are. To you, they're this big. To God, they're this big. Not that they're insignificant, but he can carry them because he is strong where you are weak. He loves you. He's got your back. I see some people nodding. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Those people found meaning in staying close to God, spending time with God, worshiping God, even serving, and God showed up in a big way in their life. If you find yourself at a place of darkness, remember songs like we sang earlier or verses like Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Pleasures that are not fading. Pleasures that do not go away. Pleasures that do not leave you with a hangover. The joy of knowing who he is. Man, spend time with your God. He will light the path for you. I love how John puts similar words in the opening words of his gospel in John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. All things were made through him, and without him, not as anything made that was made. He created you. He created me. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus Christ overcame hell, death, and the grave for you and for me. He came that you would have life and have it abundantly. He is sad. I am sad when we begin to drift. When we begin to go to that place where, oh, life is meaningless. Oh, life is full of pain. Oh, life has its hurts. Life is sinful. Life is dot, 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 dot. And sadly, what often we do in our humanity is to cope with the pains of this world, we go try to find our hope in things like comfort, pleasure, or entertainment, right? We go out there and we seek comfort in the arms of people that we shouldn't. We seek to entertain ourselves and things like football teams become our God. Guess what? The Jaguars are not your God. Two weeks ago, you were like, hallelujah, Jesus, they're going to the Super Bowl. And then last week, they looked like they, oh, man, I mean, it was bad, right? It was not good. And some of y'all, I know some of y'all be Gators fans in here, right? And you're like, ooh, you're on top of the world. We won by one point. Come on, Jesus. We won by one point, right? Your emotions, like some of you are smiling. You're, you're like happy. And then all of a sudden, you're letting your emotions ride on what a football team does. How many people do you know maybe in your workplace who if, if the Jaguars or the Gators lost, it is a bad Monday morning and you don't want anything to do with those people, right? Because their God has become this form of entertainment. That is not your God. Remember what Solomon said in the book of wisdom? You're not going to remember these names one day. We're not going to remember what team was the Gators or the Jaguars. We're not going to remember Kavanaugh or whoever. All these things that seem so much drama on either the world stage or a local stage are meaningless. The thing that endures, the thing that surpasses, the thing that lasts forever is a relationship with Jesus. So don't try to find your hope in comfort, entertainment, or pleasure, or God forbid in the bottom of a bottle or in the arms of someone that you shouldn't be in, right? Don't find it in being a workaholic. Don't find it in any of the things of the world. They will all leave you wanting. There is one thing that will bring you everlasting joy, right? It's that relationship with Jesus Christ. For we know one day he will make all things right. He will make all things new. And he wants to start that process in you today. How cool is that? If you're one of the people that I've been talking about that's struggling as you're here today, he came to bring you hope. If you find yourself here and you're on top of the world, praise God. 
How awesome is that? He uses those moments where we're doing exceedingly well to build up a shield for us so that we know that one day if the enemy attacks or circumstances change, we know that we can overcome because he's already helped us overcome at some point in the past, right? He also uses those moments where we're on top of the world to share our stories with others who are going through it right now to bring them hope. And often he'll use the very thing that troubled you so much that you overcame as your opportunity to share in the life of another who's going through the same thing. That your very life and your testimony will bring them hope because you have overcome the world by the power of the blood and the word of your testimony and by the power of the Holy Spirit and his anointing in your life. You now offer hope to them. You could say, I once was broken, now I'm not, in Jesus' name, right? Amen. I once was an addict, and now I'm not. I once was dealing with this, and I didn't have a child, and God gave me a child. Or he did it through a unique way, and he gave you a child through adoption, whatever it might be. You don't know what God's plans are for you. But you can offer hope to another by what you've gone through. And if you're the one who's going through it today, man, we're here to bring you hope. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? We're a little short. Time-wise, we've gone a little short, I should say. Wanted to get you home in time that you could mourn over the Jaguars. It's all good. (laughs) I tease. Father, we thank you and praise you. You are our God and King. We've been on a bit of an emotional journey so far during the course of today's message, and I thank you for taking me there. I thank you for taking us there. Maybe during the course of the message, there were some things that stung. Maybe it was even early on when I talked about finances. You're in the midst of it right now. Man, God is here. His presence is here. He loves you dearly. He doesn't want to leave you where you're at. He's placed people around you who love you, who maybe brought you here. Maybe it was all you could do to just stand and walk through these doors today. We are so, so glad that you're here. So there's a couple groups of people that I'd love to pray for today before we go. And the first one is maybe you wouldn't call yourself a believer in Jesus, but you've walked through these doors and today God's message of love and hope has penetrated your heart and you want to surrender your life to him. Man, that's the greatest decision you could ever make in your entire life. The second group of people are those who, you are a believer, but you know that today's a day where you really need to rededicate your life to him, that uh, maybe you've been going off on your own just a little bit, trying to do your own thing, and today's the day where you say, from this moment forward, Lord, I want to live my life for you and you alone, and uh, I'm not going to look to the left or the right, I'm going to look solely towards you. That third group of people, you're the ones that uh, are going through it right now that I talked about, and You know, pain seems overwhelming. You've been spending too much time in your own head and you need a touch from God today. You need him to deliver you from yourself. You're asking that he would replace those tears of pain, those tears of challenge, the circumstances that you're in. He would replace that mourning and turn it into a better place, a place of peace, a place of hope, a place of forgiveness, a place of joy. Maybe you don't see your way there right now. It seems dark, but those verses we read said that he'll illuminate the darkness and bring you through that. I'd ask that all heads be bowed and all eyes closed right now, man. If that's you, any of those three groups, you need to surrender your life to God. You need to rededicate your life to God today. Or, man, you're going through it and and you need prayer. I promise I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you, but I would like to pray for you. If that's you, would you do me a favor? Nobody's looking. Just raise your hand up real high where you're at. I see your hand already and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours over there and yours and yours and yours and yours. Thank you, God. And yours, ma'am. Don't miss this opportunity. Yours right there. Thank you, Lord. Lord, so many in this room are going through it today. And uh, Lord, I start by praying for them. Father, my heart was heavy through the course of this week because of many of the challenges that we hear about, but my heart does leap with joy and seeing the numbers of people that have overcome. And I want to count those among the overcomers that just raised their hand today, Lord. Those who are struggling in the midst of it, Lord God, would you give them the courage to reach out? 
Would you give them the courage to plug into a small group? Would you give them the courage to share with another person what's going on, that they might start to receive the hope that you have in store for them? Lord, I pray for them right now and know that you are a God who illuminates our path and can change our circumstances. Father, they might not know the way right now, but you certainly do. And I ask you to bring that kind of discernment to their heart and their mind. For those who are struggling with someone else who they have no control over, Lord Jesus, we ask you to intervene in that other's life, bringing health and healing and wholeness, Lord Jesus. Father, we ask that you would give us all a great desire to spend time in your presence, to spend time with you, to look and walk and act and talk more like you, to bring our grief to you, to bring our joys to you, to bring all of life's circumstances to you and lay them at your feet as an act of worship. Lord, would you take the bad and take it away from us? Would you take the good and multiply it? Would we experience that peace that surpasses all understanding that is talked about in your word? Father, would you turn truly our mourning into dancing this very morning? So I speak life and hope and peace over those who are in the midst of the struggle right now. Father, I come to you this morning rejoicing with those who are dedicating or rededicating their life to you. And Father, I start by saying that if that's you, I encourage you, don't just walk out these doors after the service. Come right up here to the front. Myself and other people up here would be glad to pray with you, to give you some next steps, to help you point yourself in the right direction towards what God would have for you. So, Father, we come before you as a show of faith, and all of us together today just declare that, Jesus, you are the Son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again, that we might have life. Father, we stand on the words of John that we read earlier. You are King. You are our Creator. You're the one who formed us and shaped us. You're the one in whose image we are made. Father, forgive us for our sins that tarnish your image. Lord, would you remove them as far as the east is from the west? Lord, would you set us on a path to righteousness? Would you clear off that mirror so that we could see clearly and that our lives would be a reflection of you? We thank you for forgiving us of our sins by the power of your blood that was shed on Calvary's cross that has the power to forgive us sins past, present, and future. Lord, from this moment forward, we make a declaration on earth and in the heavenlies that we will serve you and you alone that we will not seek comfort, joy, or entertainment as our God. We will seek Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. We worship you. We acknowledge you as King. We surrender our life to you as the one who truly can bring joy from the inside out today and forevermore. So I speak life and hope and peace over the people of Journey Church. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place. As we leave and go about our week, would you give us divine opportunities? Would you put people on our path who we could share the good news with, who we could share what you've been doing in our lives with, that they too might find the hope that comes from a relationship with you? Would we live our lives on mission for you in Jesus' name? And everybody says, God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. Go listen to 30,000 pounds of bananas. You won't regret it.